Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. I really appreciate your attention, your support, your consideration. Anything you can do to help us keep on keeping on is appreciated. And we have with us today two of my favorite people, and we have a bunch of favorite people that we're able to get on these things. And TK Brown Taylor from Augusta, Georgia. All Indeed, right. Augusta, Georgia. All right. And now TK has declined invitations to have a starring role in the Masters tournament coming up this weekend. So. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but but we'll look for you when the trophy and the green jacket are given out. You should be there somewhere. That's right. I, I went out for one day and I had this this yellow, bright as the sun outfit. So you could spot me anywhere. And I, everyone in the green jackets kept coming up to me. We like what you have on because we can pick you out of the crowd. <laughs> uh, cool. You should do that again. And <clears throat> Brother Ben Davis, law professor at Washington and Lee, Professor Emerita, Emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law, formerly with the ICC in France, uh, honored with the Chevalier Award in recognition and just a really good, fun person. So we have two really good, fun people here today for another difficult conversation to make good trouble. And one of the things we were talking about before we got started, TK, that might be worth taking a look at. In these times that are so divisive and so acrimonious and so oppositional between people, not just politically, but Oh, education, healthcare, everything. How do you get people to see you in the way that respects and understands who you are, who you choose to be? What do you do to promote that? Well, I think you have to be what you need others to be, right, Chuck? In order to promote being seen, you have to be agreeable to see others. That means having respect, having civility, being curious. And I think that's missing. You mentioned being divisive in today's and all of these spaces. I think because it's we've gotten so comfortable being disengaged with each other. And some of that is, you know, just because of convenience and comfort and I want it right now. And all those, all those things could probably be placed right at the toe of technology, these cell phones, and just creating this kind of comfortable space of not engaging with each other. And so I think in, in order to get what you need, I think you have to be what you need first. And to, to be seen, like to, to, to be curious about others and not be so, you know, just hard pressed and, and selfish. Because I think most of us are selfish and don't even realize how selfish we are. Hmm. What are some manifestations that show you that? Examples of? Uh, oh, that's a great question. And I could go far on the spectrum. One of those is is I, I want to lean into that being curious piece is being so kind of hard toe with what we believe, what we feel, what we think, and not being willing to listen because naturally we want to get our point across. We want to share and give you our perspective, our opinion. And while doing that, Oftentimes we're missing what Chuck and what Ben feels and think and what they bring to the table. And so that curious part is, is certainly one um, that prevents us and preempts us and gets in the way of us kind of being just still and in a moment and being open. So wait a minute, let me let me give you the floor first and then because I know how I feel. I know how I think. <laughs> let me give you the floor first to, to be able to hear from in your position perspective and how you approach whatever the topic, subject, dialogue, matter, whatever the issue is. And so often is we have to be first. We have to get our point across. 
and and um and sometimes that just gets in the way because now we're already in conflict and conflict is all now is the barrier um and there's so many ways we could tackle that wanting to be right having pride I'm, I'm sure Ben would agree like there's so many things that just kind of get in the way of us being able to be available to each other you know that's a really great perspective and insight and i want to ask ben in just a sec but it calls to mind a great saying from the wonderful bill yuri one of the great mediators practitioners and teachers and authors Indeed. about it of anybody he said you know the challenge is to stand up for yourself without stepping on the other person's toes. Right. And these are times when there's a lot of hard toe stepping going on. In fact, a lot of shin kicking and butt kicking and stuff like that. And so, sometimes that's needed, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's needed, but we have to, even that is probably a skill in how we do that, right? <laughs> You know, and that's a really good point because it calls to mind for me, my first wife and I, although we don't, we're not still married, we don't live together, we're still best friends. We talk to each other every week. We're the partners in the family with the kids, with the grandkids, you know, consult on everything and help each other out and get along wonderfully. Probably better than if we tried to stay in the same house. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the three key women in my life currently, my second wife, my mom before that, when she was alive, my sister, and then also the fourth, my daughter, and I'm sure my granddaughters as well, have all made it crystal clear to me, if I ever treat my first wife with less than the respect, the affection, the honor, and the dignity she deserves, my butt will be kicked for good reason. And I completely agree with that. So Ben, how do you get people to see who you really are and want to be. I, I'm going to go with the, probably the, the more, the, I, at least what I find the most, the more difficult moment um, where um, you reach out to somebody, you know, maybe you're in line at the grocery store or something like that. And uh, you're doing the kind of neighborly comment, you know, about something. And you're both strangers to each other, right? And it's always interesting to watch. On some occasions, you'll have people who will be, uh, who, who will ignore you. I mean, it just, just, it's not that, you know, it's, it, they don't say anything. They don't come at you. They just ignore you like you don't exist, okay? Um, and then uh, most of the time, you kind of have a little repartee back and forth about sort of the being in line at the grocery store experience, whatever it could be. It could be something, you know, the, the eclipse, talk about the eclipse or something like that. So I, you know, that, that I've had that happen recently where um, I was in line for something. I just kind of made a comment like that. It could be that the person couldn't hear, you know, that's a whole other thing. But I, I noticed that they, uh, you know, they didn't react at all, right? Um, and so that makes me think that maybe part of all this is uh, is sort of the acknowledgement of the other person when they come towards you. Just, you know, you're not, you're not the best friends. And, you know, sometimes you can be like, well, watch out who this person is, you know. But but the, the idea of acknowledging them uh, as as someone who is speaking to you, I think that that is uh, maybe doesn't seem like much, but but it is it is something. Um, the other thing about yourself, um, I actually was at a speech uh, by uh, Judge Ludig of the mm. retired from the Fourth Circuit, who he's been on the kind of war path uh, about. Uh, the January 6th stuff and everything. I was at a speech with him where he spoke to the students at Washington Lee uh, last, I guess it was Tuesday night. And one of the things that really struck me about what he said was that he said that uh, there are moments where you've been preparing your entire life and you didn't know it for that moment. 
And then there's that moment and where you have to decide what to do is the right, what's the right thing to do, right? And I found that just like a really amazing way of describing these sort of critical times when you have to express yourself as who you are, who you've been created by. It could be that, that grandmother, it could be whatever. But you have just been created this way, for, and that's your moment, um, without you know being obnoxious or anything like that. But just sort of being your deepest, truest self in some way. Um, and when you have those moments, um, you know, there's the response that you get, right? I think that people can sense that, right? When he, I was listening to him speech, I always thought it was a very conservative, you know. He turns out to be a very warm, really kind of remarkable fellow, right? As you 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 get to see him, right? You know, and you say, what was that precondition and pre, you know, prejudice in my head about what I expected him to be like, right? You know, um, in fact, he hugged my wife. You know, I was like amazing. A judge comes up and hugs your, you know, your your spouse. It's just that is so cool, you know. Um, but you know that comment that he made about you know, what, what is that? True self, and I think we all have those moments uh, that come along at certain times. And, you know, it's a really difficult moment trying to figure it out. And the way that he described it is like literally your entire life has been preparing you for that moment and you didn't know about it, you know? I was like, wow. Maybe, you know, the entire life has prepared you for that moment of being in line with that person at the, at the store. And, to sh and and theirs too. And all of a sudden there's like this connection, you know? Uh, now, sometimes the person is going to be so cold and, you know, you can feel some regret, I guess, but you don't have to feel hate. You know, you just have to feel we weren't able to connect, you know? Um, the only other thing I was thinking of was... Um, one morning when I lived in Paris, I was going off to work, and I saw this old lady walking with this little baby, you know, like walking your grandchild kind of thing, right? And my first reaction was to see a grandmother with her grandchild, right? But then I had this thing that flipped in my head where I saw a black child with a old white lady. And I looked at myself and said, what was the thing that made that flip in my head like that? From just seeing a literally grandmother with her grandchild and then seeing an old white lady and a black kid. Like, what were those two things going on in my head at the same time, you know? And, uh, you know, it, it makes me think of these, these uh, moments we go through where we can look at that, like the NCAA women's final to take one thing where people have looked at how the reaction has been to who won and who lost, right? Um, you know, the Caitlin Clark stuff, seen her as a baller, uh, but then, you know, the other team wins and uh, more is focused on her than on the other team that won with, you know, Dawn Staley and all. And then I remember Dawn Staley in her way, at her moment, at that time, you know, showing such grace towards, everyone it was like a lesson to me it's a lesson to all of us you can see why he's been you know but she's won three times and 38 no and all those women that are with her are going to be created and i think every woman who plays against her is imp and on all of us watching you know are just impacted by the way that spirit of hers comes out, you know, in, in ways that transcend, okay? And, uh, you know, that, that was just something that really struck me because we, it just was really, why were people going into these trips as opposed to just recognizing greatness, you know? Real, I mean, amazing greatness, right? What, what's the trip? Um, I don't know if you heard about this. I'll, I'll finish up. There was this... Uh, UConn player got an award named uh, Becker or something like that. And so she's a basketball player, right? But in her thank you speech, uh, 
young white woman, she just did all this praise of black women in her thank you speech. You may have seen it online and, you know, what they've done for the sport and all that stuff, you know, and it, and I was looking at that and I said, you know, it, it, it was just really cool. You know, I mean, it was really cool in this time, right? In this time with all the efforts to make us separate from each other. It's, I don't know, those kind of things strike me as those moments of connection like that, you know, that really impact and, and are hopeful for where we might get to, you know. I could add one other thing, which is that, you know, there are conscious efforts to divide, right? Really, that's a strategy to make us always be separate from each other, because then the person keeping us separate has control over all of us, because we're all sort of atomized in our corners, right? And so one of the, the magical things in life is to work towards those connections with others, even though their efforts if you can interpret, for example, the way that someone is trying to make you separate from somebody else, you've kind of released their power towards you. And and you build the connection with somebody else, I, at least in my experience. And that's uh, an important thing to also be aware of. If you're feeling that division thing, think about, what, you know, who's benefiting from it? Who's trying to make you feel that way? I don't know. That's just some thoughts, you know. No, and those are really not only important insights and perspectives, but they connect really well with what TK was talking about, too, because exactly what you identified, TK, is we live in an age where contact can be instant. And in fact, that instant contact demands and expects instant re response because it can be done instantly. But connection has to be earned over time. Mm -hmm. Connection goes to a different level where trust is earned and built and won. <clears throat> Contact doesn't include that. So it excludes, and you're right, we've had a period of years now during the pandemic when people were physically, geographically, and emotionally disconnected from each other and in many ways from ourselves. And now we're at a point <clears throat> where reconnecting, not just recontacting, but reconnecting isn't coming easily to us. And so one of the things I've had the good fortune to experience <clears throat> in Mexico in February and March, in Vietnam, September and October, and again uh, in March, in a collective society, people see themselves and others as parts of units, families, extended families, neighborhoods, communities, school classes, whatever. But they're all parts of unit. They're all grains of sand in one beach. And what happens with the way that people see and treat each other in that kind of collective society is so different from a fragmented, individualized society where the connections have been removed and only the contacts remain. For them, the connections are always at the center. Mm. And the connections are the source of all the meaning and value. And it's intergenerational, it's interfamily, it's interpersonal. and just being able to get there and experience it is absolutely wonderful because to be with people whose meaning and value is in looking for, seeing, respecting, understanding, honoring, and serving the value in others, it changes your whole feeling about yourself, about life, about what's possible in human connection, not contact, but connection. So if you think of instances where that's happened in your life, TK, for example. Well, I'm hearing you talk, Chuck, and it's bringing together some of the thoughts I was experiencing as Ben was kind of sharing some of the stories in response to your question. And two of the words that come 
in 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 what you were saying in his stories, you meaning connection, is kindness. I, I have a sign, although you can't see it behind me because it's blurred out, but it says you will never regret being kind. And being mm-hmm. talked about the grocery store, the smallest things, but how meaningful and how impactful they are. Just a smile. Just smiling to someone could save someone's life, really. Because to your point, Chuck, they see meaning in themselves. They see value in themselves. And the, and the way that Ben was recounting those sto- the story that he shared, my mind went to my own neighborhood. I happen to live into like one of the oldest subdivisions, um, but it happens to be the largest subdivision in the, the part of Augusta where I live. And I often, like you, Ben, wonder when, because we always have walkers. I don't care what time of morning, day, night, before sun, moon high you will see someone walking. And I always wonder those folks will you will look you dead in the face and will not budge and say a word mm. and or will quickly look away. And so I even think about those things when we talk about connection and uh, into your, your own wonderings, Ben, and what are those individuals thinking or what would make us kind of have that response or that reaction? Um, and I think even... To your um, point, Chuck, in that it's connection and not just contact, it almost becomes like a norm for all these, as I shared before, community is hard to build and develop and sustain, right? Mm-hmm. Meaning you could have all these neighbors. I even think about my neighbors. I, You know, growing up as a child, we shared food. You know, we kept our doors open. Um, you could discipline the next door neighbor's child, all these different things. Um, and I can tell you, I just had a neighbor, my the neighbor across the street, husband's passed away, and he was only in his mid-50s, early 50s from cancer. And um, and just had the other neighbors rallied around. But um, I realized we didn't even have that neighbor's phone number. Like, we're cordial, we're friendly, but to even express how we want to support her, the, the wife that is in her loss, we didn't even have a phone number for her. Of course, we could walk around, the, walk across the street. Of course, we did see her a few times coming and growing as she was green family, but it just reminds you how disconnected we are, even with the people we live next door to. So, um, but, but, but I think some of that is two words. I, I didn't say the other word. And the other word is fear, right? Some of us look away because we don't know what the other person's response is. Is it going to be the response that I expect? Or that I like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, but I, I think kindness, us taking on that mantra of we will never regret being kind. And kindness is, is small, as Ben mentioned, but it's so meaningful and it's so impactful. Those, those, those small, kind acts that we could do to really connect to others and connect to other individuals. And then get beyond our fear. Because I think fear yeah. is what keeps us from doing all those different things. Yeah, it got, it got me thinking of um, when we moved down to this little subdivision down here. Uh, it's a bunch of bunch of townhouses, you know, and they're neighbors on both sides, right? And um, you know, I this was maybe the pushing it too far. When I lived up in Toledo, we used to have kind of a a neighborhood party, okay, where everybody would bring a dish and we'd kind of block off the street and everybody on the street would, you know, get together. And I remember sort of, I don't know, I lived there a year, year and a half here. So I was like, okay, why don't we do that with all, because I knew, you know, I met everybody kind of around here and I was like, it'd be nice to have all these people get together, right? And started talking with people about it and you know, there's, there's some Spanish folks over here and they were, that's, the daughter was explaining in Spanish to the mother and she's like, and then, you know, that so that's the connected part of it, right? But then the other part of it was that, you know, there were some gunshot things, you know, that happened somewhere nearby and all that stuff. And there was this thing in me that said, you know, you don't know who might show up at a thing like that among all these people right around here. You know what I mean? And that fear thing came up. So... Mm-hmm. I went back to some of the people I talked to and said, you know, I was just thinking with all this little craziness that's happening out here, maybe that would not be a good thing to do. 
you know, to, to, to try to have, and it was like the shared fear, right? You know, that we, we, we were admitting our fears to each other too. And that was in a weird way, kind of a connection also, you know? So, you know, we didn't have the party, but, you know, we're kind of a little closer as neighbors, if I could say it like that, even without the party, you know, just the thought. You know, and that's a really valuable perception because the media doesn't ask. We don't ask ourselves the question, but everything you're saying is leading me to the question. How many of those shootings have been people going into groups of people who are engaging in some kind of connection? And they are very, very disconnected people, and they're taking it out on those people almost randomly. Sometimes it's racial, sometimes it's religious, sometimes there is an orientation to it, a grouping, but it's the disconnected person taking it out on the connected, the people who are working to connect. That, that's sad and scary. Yeah, and you know, how, how, you, how you bring that before the event, how you bring that disconnected person into a sense of connection. I mean, we can remember with these shootings at schools, right? You you remember being in high school or maybe uh, junior high and feeling alone, you know? I, I remember one time when I was a senior, you know, there was a, a, a senior in high school, you know, this girl walked me around campus, you know, for like two hours one day, you know, didn't really talk about much, but she just walked with me, you know, and after the end of the two hours, I said, thank you, you know, I, that really helped, you know, I really helped me just to, 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 you know, I am here with you kind of thing, you know, maybe there's lots of people don't get that, you know, that just that little bit of, of recognition, connection, uh, or with their uh, inside the family unit, you know, something's broken. And uh, it's tough, you know, when something's broken, when you see somebody who's done something. And then when somebody does something really bad, and the idea of parents or somebody who's a uh, uh, friend of the victim forgiving, I, to me, that is like, uh, you know, that is a meditation on its own, just the capacity to forgive instead of going to that hate place, you know, and it's genuine, you know, it's this unbelievable testament to something beautiful that we're capable of, you know, in the face of the most horrific thing that we could imagine, you know, it's, I don't know. You know, and it circles right back to Kay, to the kindness that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Because think of how you feel, think of how you make the other person feel, is as you go up to your apartment in the elevator or your office in the elevator, as they get off on their floor, you just smile and say, have a really good day. Think of, the, <laughs> think of the feeling that that gives them to take with them as they step out of that elevator. You just offered them a gift that reminds us of Einstein's famous saving, saying, which is, a life of service to others is a life worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are here to connect with each other and to learn with, from, and about each other. And we need to let that be first in the ways that we see and connect with other people. T.K. Brown Taylor, and, or Taylor Brown, and, and Ben Davis, thank you so much. Hey, any last thoughts, T.K.? Yeah, it's a good day to be a good day, and we will never regret being kind. And so it's those small acts of sending people on their way, getting off the elevator, doing something unexpected, right? <laughs> doing something unexpected, have a good day. And so just being able to connect, just stepping outside of ourselves and doing the unexpected.
expected of ourselves, saying hello, bye, how are you? Is there something I could do for you? Just doing the unexpected. Being the person in the grocery line who looks back it, at the person well, behind you and says, you've only got one or two things. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Those, those, there are, those are, those are. Ben, last words? I, would, I just would say that, uh, you know, the, the effort to try to reach out a little bit, if you're capable of it. You know, sometimes we, we are under the load of life, right? Okay. But, uh, but if you can reach out, I, I certainly, in a way, I was thinking about the role that churches used to play, you know, more of these places of gathering. And then afterward, there was a meal after the service in, in the, uh, in the church rectory kind of thing. And there would always be this kind of the intergenerational moment, right? And then it might last an hour after the service, and then, you know, everybody would sort of make their way to where they were going, right? You know? Um, I, you know music. I, yeah, music. That's a that. great idea. We need more fellowship halls, for sure, you know, Ben. Fellowship we, halls, you know, you, know, you know? If you put food and music together in a place, and you simply offer people the chance to come, to be welcomed, to be included, to belong. This is our Think Tech conversation to invite you. Share in the food of thought, share in the music of understanding, and pay it forward. Thank you for joining us. Aloha. Have a good rest of the week and weekend. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.